We're going to talk about female hair restoration as a topic here. Hello. Is this thing jammed? No. Okay. I just emphasize again, this is an advanced topic, something you should not be engaging in when you first start. Female transplants are difficult. There's a lot of esoteric issues, medically speaking, that you have to know about. We talked about some of those things as a reminder for you. We're talking about low iron levels, thyroid, low thyroid levels, hormonal imbalances, uh, and various traction losses, scarring alopecias, various other things that could be contributing other than sort of what we see in, this, in men, which is in general a straightforward male pattern baldness. So something that you have to do some preparatory work in terms of investigation in a lot of cases. This is a devastating slide that I always like to use to show you something that can happen, and it happens quite often in women if you don't prepare them for it, which is postoperative shock loss. And this is something that even if they're on preoperative minoxidil to stabilize it, you still can have problems. So we'll talk a little bit about ways to avoid it, but the most important thing is that you can't avoid it. You can minimize the chance of it. This is even shock loss in the donor area, which I had never seen to this extent. Um, and it's interesting, I, the second time I did this lady, I actually added uh, PRP and A cell. We'll have a little bit of discussion with that later on. And she did not shock at all, so it was interesting. I, I don't think that's necessarily um, an endorsement for it, but it's just interesting. So things that you can do to minimize shock loss is very much education. I mean, that's more important than minoxidil. If you educate the patient of the possibility, then they're prepared for it. Minoxidil, I like at least six weeks. I used to do like six months or three months, and then I was at an ICHRS meeting about two years ago, and I had all these people in the room. I raised my hand. I said, how long do you guys put protection on? And they basically said six weeks, so I thought, well, maybe I'm overkill, I don't know. I, I still see shock loss even after three months of the use of it. Um, things you can do during the procedure is to decrease your epinephrine load quite a bit. Um, I just added this PRPA cell. I'm still in the early phases to see if it does anything. I think it, so far I've seen some better recovery times with it, but I, I certainly don't make any money from the company, so it's not an endorsement. Uh, re decreasing your towel clamps on the back side, being very careful the number of sticks of the tumescence, being careful not to overly dense pack areas that can cause shedding. Now, I have towel clamps twice, I guess is important. Um, and just being careful with uh, your tumescence, especially in the recipient side areas. And then afterwards, things again, minoxidil, I usually carry that all the way out to about six to nine months afterwards. And then just telling a patient that they may need other adjuvant therapies to help minimize the exposure that can occur, which would be topical camouflaging agents. We talked a little bit about that specifically topic, derm match, things of, of uh, a camouflaging nature that would go in a topical application, or um, worst case scenario is actually some kind of wig hair piece that they may have to wear. Expectations is everything. It's so important to find the right candidate. I think what's really critical is finding the right mix of donor uh, supply and demand. That is, they have good caliber hair, their, their donor area looks thick, they've got enough hairs to do the job, and they have realistic expectations about what you're gonna do in terms of transplantation. And I think it's really important to strategize to create a really good result and have the patient understand you're not necessarily gonna cover every square inch of their bald area. I'm gonna talk about some easy to, to think about strategies for women. Um, indications, again, we talked a little bit about this, uh, finding out there's really two basic indications for female hair loss to make it, I mean, female uh, hair restoration. One is, uh, you can hear from Shelley talk a little about the surgical method of hairline lowering, and then obviously just hair loss and its great variety and nature of what hair loss is. Um, donor areas, sometimes, unfortunately, with women, the areas toward the temple can also have diffuse loss if they're having a Ludwig pattern where it's diffuse across the top. Sometimes it can involve the temple hair, so you have to restrict your, your harvest in the backside. Um, sometimes they go wider in women because women, they're not going to ever wear their hair really, really short. They have a little bit of widening in the scar. They don't tend to worry about that. So long as you get enough of a harvest, you don't have to go through two transplants. So sometimes they can pull more than a centimeter of tissue, maybe 1.2 centimeters in women if they have laxity, um, just so that I can get enough hairs, if, especially if they have sparser hairs in that area. Um, these are some slides you saw earlier, just to reiterate the different types of patterns, a Ludwig pattern, a Christmas tree pattern, 
and then a uh, frontal temporal sort of male pattern or androgenetic loss type pattern. So how do you sort of strategize? The, this is sort of a simplified way of thinking about it. If you just take hair and cover the whole bald area, you may not get the results you're looking for. So I usually ask the woman, how do you part your hair? And if they part it on the left side, you may want to follow the part and then toward the central forelock, like an L going this way. And if they part it on the right, you do the L going the other way. And if you part through the center, you go a T. And if they say, well, I want to wear my hair in different ways, you may have to say, depending on the degree of loss, you may not be able to do that. I, I think we have to strategize and understand I'm not going to cover everything, especially if we're looking for a single session transplantation. So I think strategy and setting, setting up expectations, really looking at that donor area and, and their recipient area to see the uh, chance of a good result. If they've got really flimsy, fine, fragile, thin, non-existent donor hair, you may not even get anything. And so it's so limited based on what you have on the backside. Uh, this dumbbell uh, thing that I just think about, sometimes you miss the crown area and the woman is very bothered by that. And it's typically not as extensive in men, although you saw in my crown presentation a, a lady with pretty extensive crown baldness. This is just showing you this is the front on this side, the, this is the forehead, and then this is the crown facing forward. So this is just that dumbbell here and it tapered here and then there's another little circle across the back side. And you can see the sort of the whirl pattern there. Um, this is not an impressive result, but I think it gave her enough coverage that she was happy. She was actually a twin. She's on my website with her sister that had a little bit less extensive loss. And uh, this is a lady with a Christmas tree pattern. You can sort of see going from the front with a little bit of involvement toward the hairline. And then uh, another Christmas tree here. And the, and the other thing too is really important. We start to actually deal with not just central density issues, but hairline reconstruction. Whether due to loss or whether they're born congenitally with a high hairline, you really have to understand that a female hairline is fundamentally completely different from a male hair, uh, hairline. And when you're making those sites, they're much harder to do when you're starting because you have to understand how it's shaped. So if you don't understand how a female hairline is, just go look at women that are non-balding and look at all the varieties they have. And these are some examples, these are people that work with me, but you can look at uh, this hairline here and you can see the sweeping arc cowlick and the frame here is more of an oval shape, okay? There's these little bit of protuberances called the lateral mounds coming outward. But you see also there's not a lot per se of a very staggered, sometimes you don't get you know, a really, really staggered appearance like when you see with male pattern baldness because they're not balding. So you're recreating something different. This is more of a powerful central widow's peak, but a little bit less ovalization across the sides. This is Amina's hairline that you can see that it's actually more of a square with a moderate uh, widow's peak and still this cowlick whirling around. Um, if you're looking actually at the sites for a male hairline, you can see they all go forward you know, and you saw this before, I'm just repeating that slide, and to contrast it again with the female hairline to point out some of the uh, small points, you can see that this one arches across and parts here, so there's this whirl that's, that, that is creating. So, and sometimes I make these sites going straight back, which is exactly what you don't do in most men. You make the sites going forward in men. This, this one here is actually arching around this way and sometimes I have them start very rarely just going straight back because that's how it's shaped and a uh, different pattern here you see this one is arching a little bit with a less of a with a bend going forward but instead of turning like this it's turning forward so when they have enough hair existing you want to follow their their hair angles so you don't lose uh, all this precious hair that they may already have in a pre-existing uh, pre-operative setting I saw this, this is two sessions to recreate that with obviously some hair dyeing as well. Uh, this is a uh, professional bodybuilder and you can see from some of, some of the, um, you know, androgens that she's probably taking exogenously, she's had a more of a male loss and this is reshaping the frame in a female uh, fashion. And this is a couple sessions here in a Filipina just to rebuild the frontal temporal loss. And I think that's it. So that's just some ideas there. Yeah, question? Yes. You know, I really don't see that. I see that they, they really rebuild. Um, I have not had a patient come to me and they just don't rebuild it. They, they rebuild it. 
you know, and it's just one of those things that is just a devastating three, or four month, three to four months when it occurs. So it's important, sometimes up to six months, because you know, the hairs grow up you know, a centimeter or so in, uh, a, a month, so it's, it's a very slow build as it builds forward. So you need to understand that that is something you need to counsel them on a preoperative setting.